conference organizers for organizing this post COVID. <laughs> I say post COVID, it's still ongoing, but manageable, I guess. Anyway, my name is Donnie. Uh, I was an engineer, speaker, writer, and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, for a while now, I've been doing this sort of as a self employed person, which makes it all even more fun because now nobody can tell me where I can and cannot go, so I'm very happy. My boss allowed me to go here. Thank you, me. Uh, <laughs> you might be familiar with some of the stuff I've done. Uh, I have two self-published books that I wrote over the past few years. Uh, one is on combining, the other one's on core data. Uh, if you want to purchase those, if you're interested in either of them, scan the QR codes or just go to the URLs or go to my website there. I don't think they're hard to come back, but you know, here they are. So today I'm going to talk about custom Swift UI property wrappers. So what are we going to learn in this talk? Well, I'm going to start off with explaining a little bit about property wrappers and how they work. Because I know that most of us will have seen property wrappers at some point or have used them in one way or another. But a lot of people don't exactly know how they work on the inside. So before we can talk about making our own for Swift UI, how about we just talk about making your own property wrappers first and then make them cool by adding Swift UI to them. Also explain why Building just a regular property wrapper, just one that you would use anywhere, is not good enough for SwiftUI. We all know SwiftUI is a special little creature, so we're going to find out why SwiftUI is special with property wrappers. Next, uh, we're going to also talk about how we can make a property wrapper that leverages things like SwiftUI <coughs> environment and view lifecycle. Because SwiftUI has this powerful environment concept where you know, we don't have to worry about dependency injection too much because we just add stuff to the environment, use it wherever we need. But how do we take that environment outside of a view and put it inside of a property wrapper or other object? Also talk about how we can test this property wrapper. Right? Because a talk like this is really cool and sort of if you can see it without testing, you would walk away from this being like, oh cool, something we can't test. Great. Right? So July is hard to test and now we would build all these property wrappers that are also really hard to test. Luckily there is a way, it is tricky, uh, we'll get into the details of that at the end of the talk. So I'm sure that this code that you see right here looks familiar. It's a state property that maintains whether or not some boolean is active or not. It's pretty simple. Uh, we, if you've seen SwiftUI before, you know that mutating this is active property to true and back to false will redraw the view every time you change it. So what does state actually do? Because it does a lot more than just wrap some boolean value or any other value that you want to wrap. So it's a container that holds some mutable value, which is already very interesting because our Swift UI views are structs, and state is applied to a variable, which means that we can now start mutating values in a struct. The reason is that state is a container that wraps our value, which means that we're not mutating the view struct. And whenever we mutate this contained value, the view will update. So apparently this property wrapper, the state object, has some way to tell the view, hey, the thing that I'm wrapping, the thing that I'm watching changed, you need to redraw to make sure that the latest state is on screen. And what's also interesting is that every time our view gets recreated in Swift UI and we've used state, even though we assign a default value to the state property, uh, and normally every time you initialize a struct with a default value, then you know, that property will get the same default value for every new instance of that struct. However, state will somehow set aside our state and every time our view struct is recreated, it doesn't use the initial value again. So state also has some management there to make sure that it keeps track of what the state should be for a given view on the screen. All very complicated stuff, but it does a lot of things, apparently. And what's also nice is that we can obtain a binding to a state property, which means that we can let another Swift UI view mutate that one wrapped value. Right? So we can have a state property at the root of the view hierarchy. A couple levels down, we have the binding that view can have changed that value from state. And so that's all very interesting and very cool. And let's keep that in mind, right, to sort of keep in mind that what kind of Swift UI property do I ever do? Before I go deeper into other examples, or how you can build it, you might have also seen this before. Right? This one is slightly controversial. It's a fetch request property wrapper that takes some uh, fetch request and can fetch posts in this case. And so this can give our view an array of posts to show in a list, for example. So what does fetch request do? Well, fetch request 
uh, fetches data based on core data entity or a fetch request. Right? So this takes data from core data. And all we have to give it, right, if we go back real quick, all we have to give it is a fetch request. Right? So we don't set up a managed object context here, we don't pass any of that stuff. So all we do is we give it fetch request. And this fetch request product director will also tell SwiftUI when the data that it fetched for us has changed. Right? So whenever there's a new post added to core data or when a new post changed or whatever, the fetch request product director will tell SwiftUI, hey, this changed, you might want to redraw the view. So that's really cool. And it leverages the SwiftUI environment for dependencies. Because obviously, if it's using core data, it's going to be using a managed object context. There's no way to sort of decouple those two because they are uh, delivered to us in a pair. Uh, but we didn't have to pass the managed object context to the fetch request. We put it in the environment somewhere else in the app, and it's leveraged by this fetch request product director. So that's state and fetch request. And they all do a lot of things on the inside. And all we have to do is write very simple code. So is that magic? It really isn't, <laughs> luckily, right? Uh, we can all reason about what it does, and we can figure out how it does it and why it does it that way. So that means can you build it yourself. That one's a little bit more tricky. Depends how creative are you, how willing to, to go into the weeds are you, and how good are you at reverse engineering. But you can really come a long way with a property wrapper that does similar things to the ones that are built in in SwiftUI. They don't really use private APIs much. We can actually come a long way with building something cool ourselves. But wouldn't it, for example, be neat to have something like this? Right? If we have our app and it has feature flags and it uses SwiftUI, and we want to check, do we show the user their new feed or the old one? And just having a property wrapper saying feature flag, new feed, true or false, let's figure that out. You don't have to worry about passing dependencies. You don't have to worry about passing the object that would track the feature flags. It's just a property wrapper that we could use. That would be relatively simple, but how about something like this, where we can just say, hey, you know what? Give me some remote data. My posts live somewhere else. They don't live here in the app. Get them for me, use the posts endpoint, and get me an array of posts. That would be pretty cool, right? It's very similar to that fetch request property wrapper, and it, it hides a lot of complexities from us. And putting that into context, it might actually look a little bit like this. But it's very little code to do a lot of work. So, I mean, let's go ahead and um, figure out how to build that remote data property wrapper. Now, as I mentioned before, I can talk about how to do this stuff for SwiftUI. We need to talk about property wrappers in general. So let's look at the anatomy of a property wrapper. Right, the property wrapper that does a bunch of things could look like this. It doesn't involve a lot of code. Uh, the one thing that we need to do is annotate a structor class with the property wrapper annotation, and we can use that name, that object, as the property wrapper, or the type, I mean. Every property wrapper must have a default uh, wrap value. That's the one requirement for any property wrapper. It has to wrap something. If it doesn't wrap anything, it's not a property wrapper. Simple. Uh, and we also have a projected value. Right? And those are the core things to know about it. So let's look at an example where I use this property wrapper. Right? It's uh, defined here. For use here, I mean, uh, we have a var example that uses the string sample property wrapper, which means that our string sample struct receives the hello world string as a draft value. We can actually see that when we print example. Right? So when we access the, the property name itself, that's right there, um, we get the wrap value for the property wrapper. If we access the underscore prefix version, we get an instance of the struct or class that we made our property wrapper. So in this case, that would be string sample. So that's the underscore prefix uh, version of the property wrapper. And we also have this dollar prefix version here that you might have used to obtain a binding to state or that you may have used when you used the published property in a combine. Uh, that gets you a projected value, right? So in this case, I prefix the word the wrap value with the word projected, and I uh, return that projected value from the property wrapper. So let's quickly bring up the code for that as well. You can see it right here. Wrap value is just a string itself. The projected value is a manipulated string. It's important to note that the projected value in this case is of the same type as my wrap value, but it can be anything. I could also make this an array of characters. I could make this an integer. I could make this whatever I want. And so the projected value does not have to be the same as the wrap value, or the same type as the wrap value. So looking at this right here, 
right? You might have had to do this little ugly dance right here, so joy at some point when you would pass dependency down to initializers. And what this really does right, is it takes that underscore prefix for in the desired, which is an instance of the state object, right, the state type. And we can simply assign to it to create our state ourselves, right? So we don't have a default value here, but it's a non-option pool. So we can just uh, create an instance of state with a wrap value. Okay, so that would be a very simple property wrapper and uh, an example of the anatomy of a property wrapper. Now, how do we implement our own property wrapper with Swift UI? Because you just saw how you can define a very simple one, right? We can make that one more complex, but I don't feel like I need to talk about property wrappers more than you just saw, because we're going to talk about them a lot anyway. So how can we make this, this remote data property wrapper? Let's go ahead and, and use what we already know to start, right? So let's define our remote data struct here, right? It's a property wrapper. Uh, I have my endpoint that I want to use. And I have a wrap value, which is an array of posts. Right? In the real world, you would probably make this generic, but to avoid you know, having to also talk about generics a lot, I made this hard-coded for posts. Uh, we initialize our remote data with an endpoint, and, well, we set the endpoint on ourselves. So this doesn't do anything, but it is a property wrapper that we could use. Just not very useful. So let's add some data fetching capabilities to this. So I have a fetch data function here. Uh, that fetches data from some URL, right? Uh, it builds a URL based on an endpoint, and we obtain data, right? This code is fine. It should be added to the property wrapper as a function that we can call on the property wrapper. Um, and I mean, if this works, that would be great. So just because I showed you a few things that I haven't talked about, I have this URL.for method, and I have the endpoint objects. They are defined like this. Um, they're not interesting at all. I just wanted to show them so you're not thinking like, what does endpoint do, what's URL for? They do this, this is exactly how they're implemented in the sample. Um, forget about them. So about the, the fetch data function, right? I promised at the beginning of the talk that I would talk about testability, and now I'm showing you this. It's not testable at all, right? We now have to have a URL session in our property wrapper, which means that it's gonna be impossible to test this. And I mean, I'm using a URL session, but you might want to use a networking layer right, with a lot more features. But where do we get that from, right? Because we, we have our property wrapper in mind. It, it's remote data, and we pass it an endpoint, and we say, assign it to this variable called post. And that's all we want to do. We don't want to pass it our networking layer. We don't really want to worry about that at all. We want it to be very clean and very lean in how we work with it. And if we think about what we saw earlier with state and fetch request, what fetch request did is it leverages SwiftUI's environment. Right? It was able to take a managed object context from SwiftUI's environment to fetch data from it. So how about we, we see if we can do that somehow in a property wrapper? And if you've worked with SwiftUI, you would think, well, that's challenging because the environment is for views. It's not just for anybody to, to tap into. It's, it's for views only. You have to be part of the SwiftUI view hierarchy. SwiftUI has to set up the environment, inject values into it, pass them back to you. This is not easy. Luckily, we have something called dynamic property. This is available in SwiftUI, something that we can leverage and use, and something that helps us build custom property wrappers. So it's, it's defined as a protocol, and it has a single requirement, which is that we must have an update function. SwiftUI will make any environment values available to any object that implements a dynamic property. So if these objects are part of the view, and they implement dynamic properties, SwiftUI will consider them part of its, its cute little environment and add things to it, which is great. This one is interesting. It should not internally store state. And we're going to talk about that one a lot, but keep that in mind. It should not own its own state, because that's going to be a bit of a problem. What it can do, however, is it can hold on to observable objects. Right, so if you've worked with state object, observable object, or environment object in SwiftUI, you know that when one of the published properties on one of those objects changes, the SwiftUI view will know, hey, something changed, I need to redraw. What's cool is that if your dynamic property holds onto one of these objects, and one of these objects changes, SwiftUI considers that a redrawable change. So it will automatically update your view. So with this, we can actually start 
trying to implement our property wrapper in a way that it conforms to dynamic property. First thing we need to do is set up the environment. If you've done this before, you know this. If you don't know this, let me quickly go over what this does. I've defined a URL session key here, and that is an object that conforms to the environment key protocol. And all we need to do here is provide a default value for when somebody wants to obtain a URL session from our environment. I put a fatal error here. You can also just put URL session up here, or whatever makes sense for your application. Sometimes it just makes sense to give a singleton as a default value. I also put an extension on environment values, which is a uh, Swift UI object. Um, and that's how we can get key paths to the environment. Right? So in this case, I add a var URL session which allows me to obtain a URL session from the environment or assign one to the environment. So once we have this set up, we can update our property wrapper to take here the URL session from the environment by keypad. I also added the fetch data function here, and whenever switch UI calls our update function, we want to update the fetch data, so we will just go to the network, retrieve the data, update our route value, and we should be golden. Which is also set up the environment for the post view. So what I do here is I create an instance of my post view, call the environment view modifier on it, assign the URL session share because that's what I want to use in my app. Right? This allows me to put something else in the test for that itself. URL session share is fine. And of course, we need a simple view. Right? So what we do here is we just set up a remote data uh, property wrapper, takes an endpoint, uh, assumes that we're going to assign to our feed. We have a list that shows everything. And now we have all these pieces in place, what we kind of expect to happen is that the post views body will be evaluated. We know from the dynamic property protocol that whenever uh, SwiftUI is about to evaluate a views body, it's going to call the update function. So this is going to happen every time the body is evaluated, we get a chance to update our data. So that's great, because then we can go ahead and fetch our data, we update our wrap value, and when we do that, Right, the property wrapper is now different, so the body should redraw. That's what we would expect. So with all of the code in place that you just saw, and knowing what you know now, you run the app and, well, obviously that's an epic fail because nothing happens. <laughs> Terrible, we have all the code for nothing. So what could be wrong here? Right, take a good look at the code. Right, we have class remote data, it's a dynamic property of a wrap value, the URL session, the update function we call fetch data. I know that works because I, I wrote it and I tested that, I know that works. I sent a wrap value, I resume the data task, super important, we all forgot about that a million times, I'm sure. Um, so what, what's wrong here? Why doesn't this work? Right, if I would put a breakpoint break on fetch data, I could even see that that's full. So it's really not that obvious, right? I have to add it. I even, like, right, see this works because the app didn't crash, so to try exclamation mark, terrible as it might be, it wasn't a problem. Right, we should tell Switch why the data was fetched. Right? Simply updating the wrap value is not enough. Right? We need to use something like the state property wrapper or a state object or something like that to right, trigger that view update. Right? Because now our dynamic property is like a view in the sense that it has access to the environment and then it can tell the view to update. But it needs you know, one of its observing objects to be updated. So we could say, you know what, let's, let's make our state var ref value uh, and hope that works. Right? Because now if the, that value changes, the switch UI view will update because it's a state property. When that changes, that tells the view to redraw. Still big no. Still doesn't work. And the reason is there's, there's this one sneaky little hidden requirement for dynamic properties. <laughs> that they don't document, you kind of have to figure out on your own. <laughs> it's even worse is that it's not always strictly needed, it usually kind of is, but it's weird. So I challenge you to spot the difference, what did I change here? It's very small. I had to make this a struct. If this remote data object is a class, switch was like, no, 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 we don't do classes here. <laughs> Give me a struct. We're fine with structs, but not with classes. No code changed. Right? The logic is the same. We still have the state property. We still have the update function. We still have all that stuff. Run the app now. Yes, we have some posts. It works. That's great. So here's what happens, right? This is a graph you saw before. 
poster is about to die in its body. Update functions call, we go ahead and fetch data. State property is updated. And the post view body can uh, be evaluated again, and we can show our data. So what do we have at this point? We have a struct called remote data that conforms the dynamic property. Right, that struct is now part of Swift UI's view environment. It's a property record uh, that we can use, which is really cool. It takes a URL session to the Swift UI environment, which means that with a little bit of trickery, we can test it. It uses state on its wrap value to tell Swift UI that something changed, which works. It's really good. And whenever Swift UI calls update, we go ahead and we fetch data, right? Which is really neat. So about that update function, whenever it's called, we fetch data. And if you look at documentation, we see that we see a couple things actually. One is this underlying value. I want you to, to print that into your brain. It says underlying value, not the wrapped value, not own value, underlying value. But it also says the switch track calls this function before rendering a view's body to ensure that you has the most recent value. And every time updates called, we fetch data. Right? You can see that. And we update our state. It means that switch is going to call its body to update the data, which means that update is going to get called, which means that Swift, we fetch data, which means that we're going to change it, which means that switch is going to evaluate the body, which means that update. It's going to go on for a little while. It's going to eventually stop when switch sees that the data that we have wrapped at this point and the data that we are going to show to the user is the same. But initially, it's a little bit weird, and this will call be done like four to five times. So that's not great. We want to have one network call and one network call only. So we don't want to do this anymore. So one more time, what happens now is this, we're in this loop. Right? It's drawn as a loop intentionally. So we could go ahead and try something like this, right? Something very naive. This loading is false. To start loading, we set it to true. And we set it to false again when the load is complete. And before we start a load, we check whether it's true or not. You might say, well, this won't do well in a multi-threaded environment. Who cares? It's all in the main threading. Threading is not the issue here. Um, the issue is that this is a Boolean value uh, that we can mutate. It's, it's mutable, and we check here, and we mutate it here, and we want to mutate it here. But if we run this, Swift is going to tell us, well, you can't do that because self is immutable because we have to make remote data a struct, and we can't just go around changing properties and struct whenever we want. This might be defined as a let wherever we use this. So we can't mutate ourselves. So you might say, well, let's just make it state then. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, like, aside from that triggering update as well, right, <laughs> Switch is also going to tell us, maybe don't do this. Because <laughs> I'm just evaluating the body and you're telling me to do it again now, like it's it's going to cause some undefined behavior. So that's not, not good at all. And once we painted ourselves into this corner and we look at the documentation again, it says underlying value. In other words, maybe you don't want to own the data you fetched, maybe you don't want to own the networking part, maybe you just kinda of want to use that and put that somewhere else so that that could be a class. That can manage everything. And so let's do that. Let's separate this underlying value from the wrapped value. And the simplest way to do this is to just take that networking stuff, put it somewhere. Right? I made a data loader here. Um, it's, it's not terribly interesting. It does everything that we had before. It has a published property to keep track of the data that it loaded. Right? So that means that this is also an observable object, as you can see here. And whenever one of its published properties changes, Swift UI will know something changed. Right? So we're going to use this in some way inside our property wrapper to make Swift UI aware of changes to our published properties. We also keep track of whether we're loading data or not. It's just a private variable, which is fine, because this is a class, not a struct. So we can mutate that whenever we want. This part's quite interesting, right? The URL session and endpoint are both optionals. I'll talk about why that is in a moment. Is you, know, you, might, you might just want to pass them to the initializer and, and you know, set it up that way, but we can't really do that. Then we have our fetch data if needed function, it just checks, do we have URL session, do we have an endpoint, are we loading, have we loaded data before? Pretty plain and simple. And we mutate uh, the isLoading property as needed. 
And because this data loader is an observable object, it can tell our source UI views uh, that it, they need to redraw through the dynamic property. So to use it, we do something like this. Right? This um, state object here is owned by the remote data structure. Right? So it will create its own data loader uh, without passing the URL session or the endpoint immediately. Whenever our update function is called, we check, does our data loader not have a URL session? If not, give it our URL session. If it doesn't have an endpoint, give it our endpoint. For the endpoint, that is just sort of a stylistic choice, because I wanted this so that, if needed, I could extend this to change the, the endpoint at some point. Like, let's say this property rep would be used in a view, where I could say either load categories or posts or load latest or all. Uh, that might be different endpoints. I would want to reassign that. Um, I didn't quite implement it correctly to be able to do that, but that was really the point of showing you that it can be optional. Um, and also, the URL session here, SwiftUI does not set up the environment or inject everything from the environment until after the initialization step. Right, so whenever we initialize our remote data struct, the environment has not been made available to us yet. When SwiftUI is about to evaluate a body for review, the environment is available to us. So that's why the update function, when we know that the environment is set up, that's when we can safely extract values from the environment and pass them elsewhere. So that's why this has to be optional, why it has to happen here and not in the, in the initializer. It's kind of sad because the code is less pretty because of it, but hey, if that's the worst, I'll deal with it. And then of course we ask the data loader, go ahead and fetch data if needed. We don't know when data fetching is needed, the data loader is responsible for that, but whenever it updates its published property, our state object will tell SwiftUI, changed, view redraw. So with that code in place, here's what happens now. The post view body is evaluated, remote data is updated function is called, data loader fetch data if needed is called. If there's data loaded, uh, we fetch the, uh, we update the published property and the object will change for data loader emits, which will cause SwiftUI to redraw its body only once. Because once we have fetched the data, the data loader knows that it doesn't need to fetch data again. And if it doesn't fetch data, we do nothing. Just let SwiftUI do its thing, and um, we don't need to change anything. So at this point, the app still works. That's great. And that was a lot of code you just saw. And I just kind of want to remind you, what is it all for? Why did we do this? We did it so we could write this. <laughs> right, a lot of code in the background, but now if you did this correctly and had more endpoints and made this thing generic, what's really cool is that you can now use this in several screens in your app. Don't worry about dependency injection, just inject your URL session network and layer at the root of your app. Everybody has access to it, and you can write this in multiple places, so it's definitely worth it in the end. But initially, as you're figuring this out, you can imagine that at some point you are thinking, what is it all for? It's so hard. So wrapping up the uh, dynamic properties part. A dynamic property allows us to build property wrappers that drive SwiftUI views, which is really cool, right? because now we can extract all kinds of logic into objects that are not SwiftUI views, and still tell SwiftUI when it needs to update without all kinds of weird tricks. Well, maybe a few, but no, none of them too weird. They can tie into SwiftUI's environment, which is really powerful. You can't do that when you're not in a uh, dynamic property. So of course they can leverage property wrappers that exist in SwiftUI already, like state, like state object, like observable object, like an environment, and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> Apparently, it should be a struct. <laughs> I don't know. The update method is called for every body evaluation. So you do want to make sure that you limit the amount of work you do. If you don't want to end up in some sort of looping state where every time update is called, you actually update the underlying value for the property. Offload that somewhere else where you can actually keep track of do I need to fetch data, do I need to update, or is everything good? So typically you'll find that you're going to implement two objects one property wrapper and one object that owns the underlying data rather than having everything owned by the property wrapper itself. And one thing I didn't mention at all, but that's really cool, you don't even have to write a property wrapper to make this work. Any kind of object can be a dynamic property and get access to the switch line environment. So you can even just have a plain let of a view model on your switch UI view. If it's a dynamic property, you're good. You can access your environment inside of that view model. So you don't have to make this a property wrap. It's just I like the syntax for a property wrap. It can be anything, really. So, part two. How do we test this thing? 
Because it's really cool that we have this. Testing it is not trivial. Because to properly test it, so we need some place to host our game, or to host our property record at least. We need to have the switch line environment. We can't just make an instance of this and start testing it. So we also need a view to test, right? Because we want to know, does my view actually receive the updates correctly? Does it trigger redraws correctly, or does it just do nothing? So we also need to somehow receive updates when the view redraws. And ideally, we can also figure out what the proper reference current value is whenever we want it, rather than waiting for SwitchUI to tell us. So the first part is not that hard. It's just a bunch of code. <coughs> we can create our custom, uh, a custom XC test class, where we have a function where we just host any SwitchUI view. And notice that I'm doing this. And you might be thinking, well, why would you want to set up the constraints for a view that you're not even going to show? Well, SwiftUI, as we all know, is really smart. It's really efficient and really clever, and it never gets anything wrong. So whenever our view has a zero by zero frame, so it is zero pixels wide, zero pixels high, SwiftUI is like, hey, nobody's going to see this. I'm not going to do anything. <laughs> so we need to give this some dimensions uh, to make SwiftUI think somebody's going to look at this view. We know nobody will see it, but SwiftUI doesn't. Uh, and that's really all this does. It doesn't do anything more. We also need to have our, our view to test with. Right? So we have this sample test view. It uses the property wrapper. The body I have here is just a text. I don't care about putting this in a list. I don't care about doing anything with my data. I just care that SwiftUI sets up an environment for me that I can work with. To set up my tests, I could do something like this. Right? That's sort of my first attempt at testing this. Make uh, an instance of my view, add something to the environment, post my view. Cool. So, actual footage of me when I wrote this. Now, I have my uh, my view, and what can I do with it? Well, the issue is that when I apply the environment uh, object or environment view modifier to my sample view, what happens is that I get a different instance of the view back. So I don't have my original sample view anymore, which means that I can't access any properties that I define on sample. Everything is basically hidden now in the view protocol. Only the things that the view protocols can, protocol can see, I can see. So I can't see my remote data property wherever anymore. And what I also cannot really do is make an instance of my view, then grab the instance of my remote data object, and then host the view. Because everything is a value type, I would just get a bunch of copies, and everything would be detached, and nothing would work. So we should add something to the sample view that has reference semantics. If we have our struct, and we have something that's a reference type, I can take that from the struct. I don't care how many copies of the struct are made, because all the copies are going to be pointing at the same instance of the same reference type. So what is it that I want to build? I want to have my unit test. I want to have my sample view. I want to have something I can extract from the sample view. And I want to put that thing in my test. But that's sort of what I want to have. And ideally, when the sample view does something, it will tell that reference type, and then the reference type can tell my test. That's the loop that I want to have. And luckily, because this is a uh, sample view, it doesn't really matter how ugly this gets. So when I thought about, like, okay, this is sort of the pattern that I want, I thought, it sounds like a job for combine. This combine has some reference types that I can use, and I can put updates on them whenever I want. So let's make the view that tells me what I want to know. I use a combined pass-through subject here. It's a reference type that we needed. And whenever the view appears, I will send the initial value of my feed over that pass-through subject, which means that in my test, I can verify that I start with an empty feed if I want to. And whenever my feed changes, that's whenever that uh, object will change publisher fires, whenever it tells which UI I need to redraw, this closure gets called, and I will send my uh, test the current value of the new feed. Right? So that way, I can observe everything that I need. Now, in my test, I have to write a little bit more code than I had before. I just make an instance of the view initially. And because it has that reference type, I can safely pull out that results object and subscribe to it and, and observe what its value is. And whenever we get a non-empty list of posts, I fulfill my expectations. 
right? It's not the best test. I should probably first test like to get an empty one first and then the non-empty one. But I know that the default is empty, so I'm happy testing like that this thing eventually should have more than zero posts. And after that, I can host my view with its environment set up. Right? And that's fine, because it, even though this does create a copy and everything, it's still pointing to that same pass-through subject. Right? So whatever it publishes, I will see. And that works. Right? This, this test is, is perfectly valid. It's not the prettiest test, I do admit that. It does involve some shenanigans to make this actually do something. But with some creativity, we can really come a long way in testing our property wrapper. Uh, and make it something that you could actually you know, implement without worrying about how do I test this? Will it actually work? Doesn't it tightly couple everything to my view itself? Uh, do I need UI tests to test this? Not really. All, all you tie it to is the SwiftUI environment, which in my opinion is about as bad as using SwiftUI on its own. Not bad at all. Right? If you're using SwiftUI, it's fine that your SwiftUI driving property wrappers are hard coupled to living in SwiftUI. So to summarize the whole thing, you can build custom property wrappers with SwiftUI's dynamic property. You can tap into the environment, which opens up a lot of possibilities for us, which is really cool. To test the custom property wrapper, you need to set up an environment for your, your whole test to live in and for your property wrapper to live in, because otherwise you're not part of the SwiftUI view hierarchy, which makes everything a lot harder. A combined subject is a nice way to get a reference type uh, that you can use in your tests to observe that and to work with that. And yes, you can make that work with async sequences. This combine offers a way to convert a publisher to an async string. So if you really want to use async sequences in your test, you can, because it works. Thank you for listening to the talk. Uh, if you want to see the sample code that I have here, like the remote data property record, scan that code or go to that URL, and I have the sample up available. Thank you.
I know you're all waiting for the lunch. <laughs> First of all, great talk. Thank you. Uh, the networking part, or all the part related to the fetching data, or getting the data, in the past would normally be in the model. Maybe. Yes. Do you think that that's the way forward to remove the model layer at all and replace it by some wrappers? Or generally, what's your view on the future steps about architecture? Mm -hmm. so that, that's a really good question because I'm, I'm personally not sure. Let me preface by that because like, SwitchOS is so young and there's still so much happening. But I am leaning towards thinking of the view model, of the view itself as some hybrid between the old UI could view and what you would make a view model. Because a role that the view model had in UI could often was, I don't want to put everything in my controller, so I'll make a view model, I'll load a bunch of work there. A view controller is not a controller, it's a view. Right? That's sort of what people did in, in UI. Now in SwiftUI, your view is defined not so much similar to UI, right? you don't have your layout code. You just say like, this should be in the view and you handle my layout. So, Having a view model alongside that, you basically have this description of your view and its data, which sounds great. But you can also have that property wrapper that leverages the, the environment and have that be somewhat of a view model-ish kind of thing. Right? Because in the end, what we ended up with is an object that needs another object from the environment to fetch data. A lot like what you would do in a view model. It's just written differently and not, written, and not called a view model. Does that kind of answer your question? More or less, what I'm missing is an easy way how to get the environment into the state object or... Make it a dynamic property. Done. Just conform to that. Thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Okay. Thank you.